video running. Brother Edwin is not with us tonight, nor his family. Uh, his daughter, Charity, was exposed to um, COVID, and so they have, their whole family is currently going to be on quarantine uh, for a little while. We don't know how long yet, uh, but for at least a week, maybe two weeks. So, so we don't have him, and so we got some new people taking care of the sound tonight. So hopefully that works out all right. Okay, but we don't have a new person leading the singing though. Come on up, brother Bob. <laughs> <coughs> Number sixty nine. Sixty nine. Let's all stand and join in now. <coughs> On Jordan stormy banks I stand and to the Wednesday night service and it is good to be back. I was a little concerned about making it back for the service uh, Monday night. They, at Monday morning they canceled my flight and then I rescheduled to cancel it, rescheduled to cancel, rescheduled to cancel. I was getting quite concerned and so uh, we were able to uh, find a flight in Phoenix. Well, yes, find a flight in Phoenix. So we we just drove, left about 1.30, about 1.30 in the morning, and we drove to Phoenix. And we were able to get there in the morning time. So we could get home in time. So that was good. I was able to make it back last night to the house. So I'm glad to be back. I was missing all of you guys. Well, some of you. I was a few of you I weren't, you know. But, but I was. I was missing you. Thank you for praying. We had a good conference. Um, it was, I don't know that I explained it to you, but it was a, it was a missions conference. Conference, international missions conference and so we had some missionaries that were uh, missionaries to Italy actually they're military missionaries are going to establish a church in Italy focusing primarily on the, the military that are stationed there in Italy then we had another family who were veteran missionaries. They had been in Sri Lanka and they were deported out of Sri Lanka by the government and are now in the process of going back to going to the country of Philippines. And then we had a third family that they're actually missionaries to um, England. And they had both 
the husband and wife, prior to getting married, they both had worked in England um, in, in the church plants, and then they got married, and now their deputation will be going over there pretty soon. So it was really good. We had a good, good time, and my role in it was they, they had asked me to come and preach, and so we had about six or seven services total, I guess six, six seven services total that went over the course of the week. And, the church, uh, church was good. It was real good. We had a good time. And of course, Joe was able to come and join me on Friday night, so I was happy to have her. And we, we, uh, we didn't know. If, like I said, we weren't sure we wouldn't be able to get back, but we made it. But I had her at least. If I didn't make it back, I didn't need the kids, but I needed her. So, <laughs> so that was good. So thank you, thank you for your prayers, and thank you for. Um, I had gotten messages from many people. I, I'm not so sure. Someone said that when I called in on a prayer line that it was coming in kind of gurgly or it was cutting off. I, I was in an area where we were at. Um, I had message. I had heard that a lot of people try calling me and my phone just wasn't ringing. Then when I would call people, they said he heard every other word. So I, forgive me if I somehow should have just passed the prayer line on to Brother Edwin and had him take care of while I was gone. And so my apologies for that. And so we'll try to get that back on track now that I'm now that I'm back home. Okay, so good. Good to see all of you here today. Well, we'll start off with a word of prayer, and then we will just go right on through with the service and pray. And uh, hopefully we'll have a good one tonight, okay? So with that in mind, Brother Ken, why don't you leave some prayer? Uh, thank you and praise you for who you are, Father. Thank you and praise you for being able to be here for the study. God, I ask you to bless each one with your word tonight. Bless the one that's praying the word. Father, I just ask for this church. I just pray, Lord, that it will continue being a firm foundation for you. Father, we'll see souls saved and lives uplifted. Father, we know that we've got many lost out there, even our own family. We just pray, God, that you would. Uh, Deal with their hearts and they want to turn to you before it's everlasting too late. Father, we know that we got sick. I just pray that you touch them. Give them a good night. Father, I just pray that uh, we'll always keep our eyes upon you. Father, we know that you can't go wrong. Father, we love you and we praise you and thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so <clears throat> we, uh, we want to start off tonight. Uh, wanted to hear how the jam program went tonight. How'd that go tonight, ladies? Very well. Very well. <laughs> very well? Yeah, very well. Oh, it went very well. <laughs> All righty. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for asking. I'll remember not to ask again, so. <laughs> the jam program went very well. That's typically how I answer my wife. How was your day? Good. <laughs> She said, what does that mean? It, it was good. <laughs> so, so, so how was your day? It was, it was good. Anyway, so uh, I was hoping to get more information in very well, but we'll just take very well this time. So. <laughs> All righty. Um, okay, so we need to go ahead and take care of some prayer requests. I, I wanted to, Miss Brenda called me today. I'll be calling in tomorrow and given uh, on the prayer lines the whole church will have it. She next Wednesday is going in for is it going to be a, are they going to run some tests I guess right Miss Brenda? I didn't hear you. They're going to be running some tests they're going to run some tests next week uh, on Wednesday is it? They're going to find out why I'm bleeding. Right. Okay. So it's next Wednesday. Wednesday. What they had originally thought that it was an infection, I guess they've ruled that out. And so now next Wednesday, she's going to Charleston, correct? Charleston. Charleston. So I'll be calling that in on the prayer line in the morning. And if you will, continue to pray for her. Obviously, obviously all of us are concerned about that, and she is very concerned. So pray for Miss Brenda about that matter, okay? All right, we want to pray for Sunday. Have a good day on Sunday. And uh, that's another one. So we'll start over here on the side. Prayer request for today. Remember Shirley tonight. She's not feeling well. Excuse me. Remember Amy for her salvage. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Remember my daughter, Paulette. She's been sick now for over a month. Her voice, she can hardly talk. So she's been to the doctor two or three times. But she's supposed to go Friday, which she won't get to go. But maybe she'll talk to him over the phone. I told her she needs to go to a nose, ear, 
stroke is the best. Mm -hmm. So remember her in her. Okay, let's follow that. And how are you doing? I'm doing much better. I'm still not, not on the top steps yet, but I'm doing so much better. I, I don't want to complain or say that. Mm -hmm. Speaking of top steps, we have uh, Miss Wilma in the back, back there. It's her first service back, and so she's looking good back there. She's, uh, I'm sorry? You got makeup on? Yeah. <laughs> that's right. You, that's, that's true. So anyway, but we're glad to see her back. And at COVID, um, probably everybody knows, but Miss, she has a rare disease. Is it? It's rheumatoid arthritis. Rheum it's not rare because my mother, my sister. But it's in your lungs, though. But it's in your lungs. That's rare. Yeah, it's in my lungs. Right. So I've never heard of such a thing. It can get in your heart. It can get in your eyes. Uh, everywhere. Okay. Well, anyway, so COVID, COVID and, and her issue was certainly not two things you want to mix together. So, but she's here. And thank the Lord for that. First time I told her, we were talking for service. First time I spoke to her on the phone, she expressed that to me about about uh, her issue with her lungs and how that she just she just didn't know when she could come back or if she would ever be able to come back and she made a decision by faith trust the lord and come and uh, she's been such a such a bright spot here at the church and she got sick and now she's back amen and so thank the lord for that all right someone else prayer request y'all remember both my son's place and father's children those in the nursing home in Levada Witt. Um, she's not sleeping very well. She only really needs y'all's prayers. That's and your nephew. That's your yes, nephew's hot wife. Right? I'm wife, right? Okay. And then Kayla Saunders. That's his Rogers great niece. She really needs your prayers too. They don't really know what's going on with her. And I have an unspoken one too, please. Okay. Very good. Lost, but, uh, remember Marquis Foster, two little girls, and one of them was So, just pray that Ella gets her life together. Okay. I still remember my cousin Nancy uh, Prince in North Carolina. She's doing a lot better. Uh, her son has COVID now, so she asked me to request prayer for him. Okay. And I have some other special requests. Also, please remember my cousin, Alice Ross. She's really having trouble with her hips, and she just needs all the prayers, please. Okay. Again, are you happy tonight? Yes, sir. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> Should I take good care of you? She's taking your advice. <laughs> <laughs> About that or on the side over here. Continue to remember Jacob, please. Jacob, okay. Willie Bowles with cancer. Willie Bowles. Willie Bowles. Bowles, okay. Uh, remember Vince and Alice, and also my nephew got to go home yesterday and just pray that he'll continue to do good. He had a vow replaced and he also had. Triple bypass surgery done. Oh, wow. Okay. So remember him. Speaking of uh, Brother Mark and his uh, Miss Tinker, I don't see him tonight. Does anybody know anything about how she's doing? Mm -hmm. Marty, I would like for the church to pray that this doctor down in Charleston will rule out cancer for me. Okay. It's, it's the Lord's whatever happens will happen. And I just praise His holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Yes, Miss Wilma. I have a first cousin in Texas, and she she's older. And she she just moved to the northern part of Texas. I asked her, did she have her power? She said, yes, we're fine, but my son and grandson, they live in Midland, Texas. And she said, they haven't had power since 1 a.m. Monday morning, and um, there's no hotels open. They can't, I mean, they're open, but they're full. Yeah. 
and uh, she was worried to death about him. And people can't even call each other. Yeah. And it's a mess down there. I heard before I left home, there's 24 people dead. Mm. Wow. And they need to stop using these windmills and stuff and get some coal and gas or whatever. Yeah, it was interesting. And I want to thank God I'm better and come back here. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, yes, ma'am. The spiritual needs of my family, my son's more than that, and my son Warren hasn't had power since last Wednesday. Last Wednesday. And uh, my friend and his family. And I read this the other day, and it encouraged my heart. I hope it encourages everybody else. But it said, "Be encouraged." The king is on the way. Amen. Amen. Uh, Pastor, uh, you all remember those two families that lost their two 19-year-old children in that car wreck in Okia? <coughs> I don't, I, I don't, I don't, this happened while I was gone? Oh, I, I wasn't aware of that. There was a man coming the opposite direction, facing them, and they were going this way, and he was coming this way, and they, I guess, hit him head on, and all three of them got killed. Hmm. The man actually had a stroke, died before the collision. Uh, I didn't hear the newspaper. Yeah. How sad. How sad. Okay. Okay, well, let's uh, take these uh, prayer requests to the Lord and uh, ask them. I ask the church to be in, uh, to be remembering about uh, missions. Uh, Mark, the month of March, we're going to be, have an emphasis on missions. We'll have some missionaries that will be coming each week. And so just pray the Lord, use that to stir our own hearts and help us during that month that we can be a blessing to missions as well. So with that in mind, Brother Andy, if you can stand and lead us in prayer. Thank you, our Father, for this opportunity to come out tonight. We're thankful for these that made their way out. And we think of those that weren't able to come. We ask that you would be with them and help them with their needs. Thank you so much for our church. Thank you so much for Jesus and knew no sin. Amen. Took our place on the cross that we might have hope and we might have everlasting life. We're just so thankful for his grace and love. We thank you for this church. We thank you for everyone that's here. Each home is represented. Thank you for our pastor and his family. We just ask that you would uh, richly encourage him and help him. We pray for the community, for the ones that go out and take food and blessings to the children. We think of the families, uh, the parents, and the grandparents that are involved with their upkeep. We pray that the spiritual needs will be met. Pray for those tonight, Father, as we've heard. So many people are sick, going through hard times, and they certainly need your grace and your peace that can overshadow them and help them uh, along their way through their difficulties. Be with those that help uh, minister to their needs. Thank you so much for your grace and for your love. We just owe you all glory, praise, and honor. I ask you to go with us throughout this service to be with our, our leaders, Father, uh, both locally and nationally, convict of sin, draw them that they might make godly decisions pray for this country. We're in dire need of godly wisdom. We just ask that you would minister to those. Help them to make right decisions. Be with those that are sick in body tonight once again. Be a peace unto them. We ask it all in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right, testimonies. Do we have anyone like to stand and testify? Anyone else? Anyone? I'd like to stand and pray the Lord. You know, you listen to all the stuff from mom, you know, you just sit and think, well, God's not good. But God is good. Amen. Amen. Hey, we're in this old world. This is a world of troubled times. And the Lord, Lord knows it, and He knows our hearts. And He knows as long as we're going to be here, there's going to be good times, and there's going to be bad times. Amen. That's a sad part of life, but we have an eternity hereafter. And 
if, if we dwell so much in all the bad times, we'll forget about God. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know there's not a family here that's not plagued with sickness. Mm -hmm. Sickness or problems of any sort of another. And, and everybody needs prayer. Mm -hmm. But we need to be praying for the lost people because they don't have any, any, uh, any choice beyond this. Mm -hmm. Now, if we have a loved one that's lost and, and and they leave this world tomorrow, they're gone forever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but I think the the devil's being hard on people so much, and, and you know a lot of it may be our own fault. We mm. can't say it's not because you know we've not lived as dedicated as we should, and and as far as it goes. Uh, God's been really good to this country in time past. Mm -hmm. But yet we forgot about God. Mm -hmm. and all the sinful practices wouldn't have went on like that. Mm -hmm. So, but we need to be much in prayer. I, I know for all the sickness and, and folks that's got trouble times, I understand that. And, and each one of us here, we're not going to do it. Yeah, it's the truth. It doesn't matter to any one of us in this room. And I'm not trying to be mean, but we're not. Mm -hmm. Our so true. Is short. And how the Lord takes us, I mean, that's his business. He knows what's best. Mm -hmm. But the main thing is keep our eyes upon the Lord. Mm -hmm. And if we lose that, what do we have? Amen. We have no peace of mind. We have no high path and this or doing. And if we go through this trouble times, if we take time to pray for one another, hey, that, that don't make things that it won't be hard on us, mm -hmm. but it'll make things better and we'll be tighter knit and we'll love one another more. Mm -hmm. Look what this pandemic's done to everybody. It's made everybody separate and be secluded. And we have a world of coldness. Mm -hmm. But God's a God of love. Mm -hmm. So let us be much in prayer for one another and for each other and, and be a better witness. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. That was a good sermon right there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need to have Bible study now. So. Someone else testimony. I yes. just want to thank God for being so good to me while I was sick. He just gave me joy and peace through the whole thing. Amen. Um, I didn't have to cook anything for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but I still got to eat. Yeah. <laughs> and I was warm. He took care of me. Amen. I thank you. Amen. Good. Someone else? Yes, sir. You know what? I want to stand up and pray to my God tonight. Amen. Yeah, he was so good and I was so bad, but he had mercy on me and he saved my soul. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's good. All righty. Someone else want to testify tonight? Miss Francis, good to see you. Are you feeling better? Yes, sir. Good. Okay. You, you look better. No, you look great. I'm not. <laughs> I look. don't think I look any better. You don't want <laughs> I had a chicken chicken sandwich, Miss Francis, and thought of you. I had a chicken sandwich from Popeye's. It was really good, too. So. Okay. Any other prayer requests? Or any other, I'm sorry, uh, any other testimonies? Alrighty. Well, I guess we'll have Brother Bob come up and lead us in the song. And uh, unless we have a special, somebody ready to sing? Have a special for tonight? Alright, ladies, you can mount your instruments, saddle up to your instruments. Brother Bob's coming and will lead us, lead us in another song. Why don't you go ahead and stand to your feet? Number 40, 40, 40.
this microphone. James, you can go ahead and get this microphone here working, the cordless mic. Hello. It is on. All right. It's on. Well, that's what happens when you... I have it on, so. All right, open your Bibles up, please, the book of Esther, and we'll start there tonight, the book of Esther. Again, I'm very happy to be back and to be in fellowship with all of you tonight. I've, I've missed you guys. I was really, really busy. And um, didn't have... Okay, what's uh, what's going on with this? Why we have so much echoing going on? This one's on. How about now? All right, James. You're holding up the whole world back here. Can you hear me, Miss Brenda? Yeah. Okay. Miss Brenda's the only one I have to worry about. So. Okay, we're in James in chapter number three, uh, two is where we're at tonight. We're going to read the last. I'm sorry, Esther. You read my mind. I'll pay a bit of attention to what I'm saying. Just try to figure out what I'm saying. Hey, brother John, good to see you. How are you? Okay, we're in John. John. We're in John. <laughs> I'm still in my suitcase is where I'm at. So. Okay, we're in the book of Esther, and we are going to look at verse number 18 and go to the end of the chapter. And so the goal is to finish up this chapter today. I really, really just have comments I want to make, uh, just draw some conclusions out of, out of these last uh, verses out of the book of uh, chapter number 2. And it reads, Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, that he made a release to the provinces. Um, and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the King's Chamberlains, Big, Bith, Big Than, and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hands on the king of Ahasuerus. And the thing was made known unto Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen. And Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when, link, when inquisitions was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. And so that's our passages today. And really, I, my thoughts are almost random. I feel more like a devotional in how I want to finish up this chapter. I thought of breaking it up, but it breaking it up in a couple uh, different lessons. But uh, after thinking it through, I, I felt it was better just to combine them all. So we're going to touch on a couple different thoughts and complete this chapter tonight. So with that in mind, let's pray and ask the Lord's blessings. Lord, we pray that you would guide us in the study of your words. We thank you that in your wisdom and in your love that you've given us your words. May we be good stewards of them. May we listen, may we read, and may we meditate and apply and live and cherish the words that you've given us. And we pray, Father, tonight that your spirit would have control and help us to gain from this time the strength that we need, the encouragement that we need to stay true and faithful as Christians and as believers of your words. You're faithful and you're so very good to us. And we thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we have and claim it. And we thank you, Lord, that you're with us and we claim it. And we pray that you guide us through this night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, you remember the last time that we were in the book of Esther, which was the week before the revival, uh, we worked our way down to about verse 17 really is where we were at. And at that point, Esther has become queen. Now, um, what we dealt with in the last lesson out of uh, the last, that last lesson was just the ethics that was involved. And, and what I was really addressing was, was this idea that Esther had done something that perhaps was, there was something right that they wanted to do, but they did it in a wrong way. 
Esther had uh, found herself involved in a beauty contest and she should have never been involved in a beauty contest. And, and I guess conclusively what I was emphasizing was that it would have been better for Esther to be humble and to be poor and to be unknown and to be in the process of traveling back to Jerusalem than for her to be famous and rich and the queen to the most powerful man in all the world. What, what, what difference does it make? What opportunities may be acquired from being queen if in turn she's done this in a way that required her to disobey the commandments of God because that's what Esther did. Now God used her in spite of herself. And isn't that always true that God uses us in spite of ourselves? God used Mordecai in spite of himself. And, and so as I read over Esther and I read over Mordecai, uh, Esther nor Mordecai are, are favorite characters of mine in the Bible. And I have to believe that God grant, is granting mercy to both of these two, perhaps because of limited understanding, limited enlightenment that they had. I don't know that to be true, and, and I, that's presupposition. You know, I'm, these are assumptions. I don't know, and it's not anything worth even arguing about. Uh, there are different opinions about the book of Esther, but I'm making very clear that my opinion of the book of Esther is not an opinion that I, in turn, would make out Esther to be a hero, a hero that she was on a mission to do God's work. I do not believe that. I think that Mordecai and Esther both were not on a mission to do God's work. They were on a mission to do what they wanted to do and prosper in the process of it. And so when you look at the characters that were involved in the book of Esther, there it's really it's it's tainted. All the characters are tainted. When you look at Ahasuerus, or you look at Esther, or Mordecai, or Haman, and those really are the four main characters, and all of them in turn received something. They all received something. They, they received something by way of their heritage, like, like Xerxes. I mean, he, he in turn didn't build the kingdom. He, he, he in turn inherited this kingdom from his father. And you find that, that Esther, what did Esther receive? She received not riches. Uh, no, she didn't have that. She didn't have position, didn't have power like Xerxes, but Esther did receive something, and she received a very, very attractive appearance. She was beautiful, and it was, that was something that was given to her by God. Mordecai also, he received something, and he in turn had received Esther in his care. And he was, you know, had, had the responsibility and took this responsibility to raise Esther. And then you have Haman, which we'll talk about Haman next week. Uh, perhaps next week we'll get into it. I think so. Uh, we'll get into uh, Haman was another man who received some things. But in all these cases, they use what they received not to glorify God. They didn't use what they received so that they in turn could, could worship God with it. They used what they received so that they could get more. More of something else. You know, in Xerxes' case, which we've already gone over his character, he used what he had received so that he in turn could gain more territory, thereby more money, thereby more, you know, influence, more power. He was an egomaniac, Xerxes was. And yet we find that in his, his journey to get more, it resulted in him losing, really, if I can characterize it this way, his family. Because Vasti, history tells us that Vasti was his great love. In fact, it's, it's, I can't say this definitively because I, I, don't, I don't know it to be definitive. But I've read a lot of confusing things in history in regards to Xerxes. And there are some historians that say that he eventually did reunite with Vasti. And uh, I don't know that to be true. I don't know how he even could have done it because of the law of the Medes and Persians. And so I'm not saying that that is true. But there are historians that write about that. But it is true that he had a great love for his Vaxi, and uh, which was unique. And yet he lost his wife in the process of chasing after every he had so much I mean if I had if I was the most powerful man in the world I probably would be content you would think I could be content with that right but he wasn't he wanted more so he took what he had and he gambled it he leveraged it to get more in the process he lost what was something that was very valuable to him and Esther is doing the same Mordecai they're doing the same and that's chapter number two they, they really have taken what they've received and they're gambling that and hopes to get more I've received Esther I'm going to gamble her I've received beauty, Esther says, I'm going to gamble this. And you know what they're doing. You know that they know that it's not right to do. How do you know that? How do you know that? Just think about the story that we've read. How do we know 
that they know that what they're doing isn't right to do. I'm sorry? Right, you feel in your heart. Now, I think you are right about that. Of course, that is not necessarily represented for us on the pages. But there is, there is some verses that are mentioned, and I'll, I'll just point your finger to them. Look, if you will, in verse number 10. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for the Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. We just read again in verse number 19. It says again, Esther, and that's, this is verse number 10 is before, during the beauty contest, before she marries. Now after she marries him, not certain how long, perhaps it's days, but she's now married to the king uh, and she's been received as queen. Verse number 20, Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did not did the commandment of Mordecai like us when she was brought up unto him, with him. It is definitely, and I would like to make the comment that it's honorable, it's honorable that, that Esther is, is showing respect unto Mordecai. Mordecai had given this instruction or commandment unto her, and here the scripture says in verse 20 that she's listening or following him just like she did whenever she was a little girl raised up in his home, and that's honorable. And, and by the way, honor the Bible says that children should honor their parents. And I've, I've got into a study on this once, trying to figure out what exactly honor is. What does it mean? Honor is of the same category as worship, but it's lower. Certainly it's on a lower platform than worship. And we are, we are commanded only to give that honor, that worship unto God. We know that. But honor, in turn, is something that we're supposed to give to our parents. And so, um, what does that mean? Well, if you're a child and you're living in the home, then, then honor means that you obey them. And as we've rehearsed this before, obedience is doing what you're told, when you're told, how you're told, and, uh, you know, immediately, and with a good attitude. And that's a challenge for children. It was a challenge for me, and I'm sure it was a challenge for all of you. But that's what honor means. Honor means that you obey. And you obey not just with your body, but you obey with your heart. You yield your heart. You surrender your heart. You bow your heart. You surrender it unto your parents, and you obey. Unless there's a reason why you should not. A greater authority, and I'm referring to God, is why you should not. And that's obedience. And young people, that's God's will for you now. God's will for your life right now. The way God will judge you, He's not going to judge you based on wrong decisions that your parents make. He's not going to judge you based on the fact that your parents don't have the wisdom that you wish they had. God will solely, only judge you based upon the fact that you obey. Period. And yet we see in scriptures men, young men like Samuel, who their mom and dad, before, right when he was weaned, was given to Eli. And Eli becomes like a parent. We don't know the age, but perhaps he was maybe five years old, four or five years old. And now he's left at the temple. And so Eli really had, really raised not only his own boys, but he raised Samuel as well. And yet we find that Eli was not a good testimony as far as a man who followed the principles of God. His own boys did very poorly. He wouldn't rebuke his boys. He wouldn't, change, he wouldn't discipline his boys. And yet Eli, in turn, had to follow a man and obey a man, someone that God had placed in his life, someone that his parents had surrendered him to. And the man that he was supposed to follow was a man that God had already prepared, was preparing Samuel to take his place because he wasn't a good man. And so obedience is what's required of you. And so I, I admire that about, about Esther, that she, she honored her parents and uh, uh, honored her parents. And can I say that obedience is what you do when you live in her home, but after you leave home, you honor. And that word I really struggle with. And, and honoring my mother and honoring my father uh, is, is, is basically means uh, certainly you want to show love and affection and support and all those type of things, certainly. But, but what it really means is, you know, let them have, you know, honor what they request unless it's not in your authority to give it to them or your ability to give it to them. That's difficult, but that's what it means. You know, I've told a story about this. I believe I told it here. My mother had come over to the house 
uh, back before the COVID and uh, my kids were riding, they were going to ride their bicycles and my mother said, now you kids, do you have helmets to wear? You have helmets to wear? And she, my mother's very, you know, gets real concerned about the safety issues. And she says, helmets. And, and, and she says, now listen, she says, listen, and I think she was talking to a little girl. She said, none of you, I don't want any of you to ride your bicycle before you have a helmet on. You, you cannot, I mean, she didn't ask me. She, no, she just completely took over. <laughs> and so, uh, after she left, I just followed up and said, girls, you heard what Mama said. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, it's my home and, her, you know, and, and, and I am going to, um, you know, my children as far as it's my responsibility. But there's no reason why I can't allow my mother to have what she wants in that situation. And so it doesn't interfere with anything that I'm doing. And what she's saying makes a lot of sense anyway. And so I think it's important that parents support grandparents, especially grandparents. Um, and that parents show honor their honor those parents, because that really shows a good picture for their own children as well for when they get older. And so too much division. Everybody wants to be their own person. I don't understand that. You know, I don't understand. I, there's still to this day, there's things I don't do because my mother didn't want me to do it when I was a child. And I don't really agree with her, but I don't do them because it doesn't make a difference anyway. You understand what I mean? And I honor. And if I didn't do it, if there's something I had to, you know, to do that she wouldn't like and I knew it was against her, then I in turn would go and talk to her about it and say, Mom, I know how you feel, but I have to do this. I know it's what's right. You see, that's honoring. There was a, someone I was counseling with one time, and, and they, were, you know, they were well in their adult years. And they said, I, I'm in love with this guy, and I want to marry this guy. And uh, I want to be with him. But my mother and my father, they're against it. And I uh, said, so, well, what do you think I should do? I said, well, I'm not getting involved in that. Mm-hmm. Can I get amen on that? I'm not getting involved in that. I mean, that's just like danger, you know. Yeah. I said, but one thing I will tell you. I said, don't you dishonor your parents. And I said, if, if that's what you've got your heart and mind set on, I said, as long as you're living at home, you need to make sure that you follow your mother and father mm-hmm. and honor them. But if that's what you feel like you have to do, and I'm not telling you should, and I'm not even telling you I agree with you about it, but I'm saying to you, that you need to in turn to separate yourself and go ahead and live on your own, pay your own bills, do all that, and then go back and tell your mother and father what you've decided to do. I'm not saying it's right, not telling you to do it. I'm just telling you that God will hold you responsible if you decide to live a life dishonoring your parents. Parents are valuable. They're valuable. And we should treat them as such. And, um, and so be very respectful to them and honor them. And, and so I don't agree with what Esther has done, but I, this is, you know, to the second thing about Esther that I, the second time I've seen in Esther, something that I think reflects good integrity. Uh, there's goodness in her. Uh, she, that we see that when she went into the king, she didn't rely upon a lot of, a lot of sensual things and you know, jewelry or whatever, and, and, you know, to try to, you know, to capture the king's heart. I, I thought that was, that, that speaks well of her. Uh, she shouldn't have been there, but though it speaks well of her. And then I see this, that she was intent upon honoring Mordecai's command. You understand, verse number 20, she's now the queen <laughs> she's now married but she still is honoring a request that was made by Mordecai I don't agree with it I think the request is wrong and to me these two verses to me are, are very conclusive and that if, if what they were doing was so right then why are they hiding it yeah it's a lot different than Daniel I mean you read Daniel chapter number 1 and here they usher in and they bring the king's meat in. They bring in the king's food. And Daniel says, I know I can't eat this. And so he then goes to the guard and says, listen, I just, I can't eat this. I can't, I can't eat this. And the guard says, well, you have to eat it. And I, I'm paraphrasing the conversation, but you have to eat it. And if you don't eat it and then you get sickly, then I'll die. And, and Daniel said, I can't. I can't dishonor the Lord by eating, the, you know, this king's food and drinking the king's wine. I can't do that. That's against my belief. And I, I want to honor the Lord God Jehovah. And, the, and they go back and forth and back and forth. And finally, the man says, OK, fine, fine. OK, I'll, I'll give you. And he gave him a period of time, allowed him to eat pulse, which would have been vegetables and water. And he said, I'll let you do it just for a period of time. But you see the honesty in how Daniel approached that. 
He wasn't hiding. He put himself in this position to where God, God in turn, honored what he was doing, and God intervened and gave him favor with this man. And that was the same with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they stood before the king, they, they, and you imagine that everybody in the land, you know, the instruments would play, and everyone would bow down, and they would worship, except for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as best we can tell. And this resulted in them being brought before the king. And they just, they spoke honestly. They didn't deceive. They didn't lie about it. They didn't trick. There was nothing. They just said, oh, king, live forever. You know, we, we don't want to dishonor you, but we can't do this. I think there's something powerful about us as Christians being true to what we believe that is right and leaving results up to God. And the fact that Esther and Mordecai, they had put into place a game plan to do something that was, we know, they were breaking God's words in the process of doing this. And I, I believe, based upon my studies, that they would have known this as well. At least Mordecai would have known that what they were doing was not right, or shall say it was not justifiable. And so they're breaking commandments. They're, they're also, it would be better, and I think if you cornered Mordecai or cornered Esther, that they, they would agree, yeah, it would be a good thing if we went back to Jerusalem. But they were staying. They didn't go back. And so now they've put together a plan. And, and many people believe that Mordecai somehow was already associated with, with the kingdom, with the king. Somehow he already had some low-level position, perhaps, but he, somehow he was involved. Somehow he knew something, somehow. And so uh, he, in turn, was desiring for something more for Esther, something more for himself. And I think that's not reading into the Scriptures. That's pretty clear. There, what other reason would there be for her to become one of 400, you know, of a harem? What other reason would there be? True love? No, that's not the case. And so uh, she, in turn, becomes a part of this beauty contest. But it required for them to do it. It required that both of them uh, had a level of deception. They decided that they, they would not speak because had it been mentioned that they were Jewish, then in turn they would have been forfeited from the beauty contest. So they had to hide this so that in turn she had an opportunity to be involved in it. And so you see here that she's attempting to do something that perhaps they feel is right to do or okay to do, acceptable to do, but they're doing it in a wrong way. And uh, just be open, be honest, and leave results to God. And uh, that's always easy to talk about. Uh, but it's one of those matters that's easy to practice, especially when it comes to those things that involve desires that you have or your own personal, you know, personal life's dreams or safeties or something of that sort. And so we see here that she in turn has gone about something and they're, they're in turn all concealed and hiding this, this idea of her, her identity. And as we get later into the book, we're going to find out that her identity becomes an issue. The fact that she hasn't declared it. And we're going to find that later on in the story that God puts his finger right on that one issue about her identity. Because her identity is what's keeping her from trusting God. She wasn't trusting God with her identity. And so had she trusted God with her identity, let's say, for instance, that they had some reason to believe that you know, they should apply for this beauty contest. I mean, they had some reason, some wild reason. If I go apply for this beauty contest, then we can send Jewish missionaries all over the world you know, to preach the Lord God Jehovah. And yet, had they, had they done this in an honest way, then God would have, could have protected her and disqualified her from it. But in turn, they didn't do that. Okay, so that's one point I wanted to make out of this. I wanted us to take a look at the aspect that, that Esther, uh, not only did she honor her parents, and I can't stress enough, you know, children, honor your parents. Just can't stress it enough. You, you will bear the fruits of that. Love your mother and father. And cherish them because one day you're going to be a mother or a father and uh, you're going to want your children to cherish you. And so love your parents and cherish them. It's right to do. And uh, when you get older in turn, um, you want to reap that fruit in your own life as well. But not only that, but you want God to be pleased with you because you've honored your parents. Obey them now. Honor them later. 
and um, prefer them later. That's what honoring refers to. And she did this. However, I think in this case, she should have said to Mordecai, I, I can't do this any longer. I need to be honest about it. And, it, and it, it really, it's Mordecai is the one that tells her later, later, he's the one that tells her not to conceal her identity, to hide her identity any longer, but to reveal her identity. And so it should have been that Esther would have had a conscience to do this anyway. Okay, so back to the passage here. We see in verse number 18, Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the print provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And so after the fact that she became queen, the king then makes a decision in verse number 18. He's rejoicing. He said, I found this woman that I love. And, uh, you know, she's captured my heart. And uh, he has another party. It's, it's funny because this king parties all the time. <laughs> I mean, in chapter 1, there's four parties in chapter 1. And now we have here another party here in chapter number 2. This is a regular occurrence with this king. And that's pretty much all the world has, isn't it? That's really the only way they have to have fun. Isn't that what the world lives for? They want to go party on the weekends. And what happens on the weekends? They, they ruin their liver. They end up impregnating themselves. They find themselves drunk driving. They end up in jail, perhaps. They get introduced to things, and they regret because they participated in them. But at parties, there is never, there isn't one thing good that happens at parties, except the fact you might have a good sandwich. <laughs> and that's about it. And yet the world still, they stumble into those parties. I live for Friday. I live for, for parties. They live for those parties because it, it in turn, it in turn is their only source of true joy or true happiness is to get into a time of mirth and joy and lightheartedness and, you know, que sera, sera, and it doesn't really matter and it all is going to end right here. I'll just party hard now and deal with the, you know, deal with the, the consequences later. We're just going to let it all hang out and we're going to do whatever. That's the best the world has to offer. And this is what Ahasuerus is doing. And he not only does that, but he wants other people to join his party and to rejoice with him about the party. And so he actually, in some way, he affects the taxes. I'm not sure if he eliminates them or reduces them or something. That's what the passage means when it says there in verse number 18 that he made a release to the provinces. He actually is, is lowering the tax responsibilities that they have toward them. He's rejoicing about his queen. He wants them to rejoice with them. So he's going to give them some reason to rejoice by he lowers their taxes. Now they're all going, yes, you know, we love of Esther, you know, <laughs> Esther's the greatest thing ever. You know, they'll say whatever because money is involved, right? <laughs> Less money we have to pay. Esther's the greatest thing uh, ever that ever was. And so we see here that um, this party goes on. I wish that our government would do that. I wish they would have a party up in Washington and then they reduce taxes because of that. Wouldn't that be good? And uh, they do party, but they seem to raise the taxes more and more and more instead of lower the taxes uh, at the, uh, you know, during the year. And so, uh, verse number 18, that really concludes what's taken place. So 18 is really just a conclusion. She's chosen as queen. He has a party. He reduces the taxes uh, for all the provinces and gives out gifts and so forth because he wants everybody to be happy uh, with him as he's partying. And in verse number 19, and when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. And I'll be honest with you, I have no idea what that means. I don't even know what it means. I've, I've looked at it every way upside down. Is this a second wave of ladies that are coming? Is this the second time that they met? Is this, is this them meeting at the king's palace where prior they met in provinces? I don't know what it means. Uh, you know, uh, the timetable is such that Queen Esther has already been chosen. Esther's already been chosen as queen. And so I don't really understand... And I'm just being honest with you. I don't really understand what this really means here in verse number 19, why we find that they're gathering a second time. I don't really see that. I read something by J. Vernon McGee I found to be interesting. He was comparing um, Esther and Xerxes with Ruth and Boaz. 
And he said, both of these ladies, of course, we know Esther is a Jew that marries a Gentile. Ruth is a Gentile that marries a Jew. And so Ruth and Esther are the only two books in the Bible that are written by women. Or not written by women, but are named after a lady. But here what he was talking about is how that, how that Esther, how that she, the Bible says that he was, she was greatly loved, greatly loved by Xerxes. But yet clearly we see in the passage that he didn't know her. I mean, he certainly didn't know her soul. He certainly didn't really have a good grasp upon her value system. He didn't even know that she was a Jew. She, he, he had no way of even knowing that, that she was a believer in, in the Lord God Jehovah. He didn't know any of those things about her, but boy, he loved her. Man, he loved her. And so we, we, can, we, can, we can deduct from that that clearly he loved her merely upon her outside, her physical appearance, and how he, in turn, responded to that. Well, Ruth, on the other hand, the Scripture says nothing about her appearance. In fact, uh, you know, some have painted a picture that she was not a very attractive lady. Well, we don't know that. You know, we know the only thing we know about her appearance is that she was she was a, she was from Moab. But the Bible says that Boaz greatly loved her. And when Boaz spoke about Ruth, he didn't talk about her outside appearance. What he talked about was how she treated her family. Do you hear that, kids? You're looking for a husband or looking for a wife. That's one, way, that's one way right there. That's one thing you should always look into. How do they treat their mother and their father? How do they treat their family? He commented on how, he treat, how she treated her family. He talked about her work ethic. And he talked about how that she had made sacrificial changes um, in going to leave from Moab and coming. And he talked about things of that sort. Clearly, he in turn was, was in love with the person of Ruth, not the body or the appearance of Ruth. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, so uh, here we see, as we go back in the passage, uh, verse number 19. I used to write down beside your verse. The pastor has no idea what that means, so just write that down, because I don't know what it means. <laughs> verse number 20, Esther had not yet showed her. We've already discussed that. Now, I want to just real quickly wrap up here in these last verses. In verse 21 on down to uh, verse number 23, it, it just changes. The events change. We don't know timetable. But we know now that Mordecai has a position. And, and I think everybody, everybody, as far as all my research, most everybody agrees that Mordecai has some type of setting position. Most would believe that he holds a position as a judge. Now, I don't, have an, I don't really have a concrete opinion. I'm not echoing what I've heard, that he in turn has a position as a judge. Perhaps that Esther has been promoted as queen, and in, 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 in response, Esther in turn is afforded that he in turn has found a place. She's recommended him, and she certainly makes a comment here in these verses that he was the one that discovered this insurrection. And so um, perhaps that's what I don't know. But he's now sitting at the king's gate. Now the king's gate throughout, you remember in the book um, <clears throat> when it discusses about Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, there in the book of Genesis, and we, we uh, find that, that lot in turn, that he now finds himself at the king's gate. Uh, we also find in the book of Ruth that whenever Boaz wanted to deal with this issue about Ruth, about marrying her, that he went to the king's gate. This is normal that the business for in that day in Jewish culture, that it would take, but not just Jewish culture, but just ancient ancient culture that they would do all their business at the gate. It's where everybody came in and went out. And so they would have representatives of their government that would sit there for the purpose of dealing with issues that would come up and would arise. That was the best place in order to find them was at the King's Gate. And so he's there and he's setting. It's assumable uh, that, uh, that he now has some kind of position as a judge, like a Supreme Court judge. And so he's there. And as he's sitting there, he in turn overhears these two guys, Big Than and Teresh. Uh, they are discussing about insurrection plans. They're upset. They're angry. We don't really know why, uh, but they're very upset. 
And uh, this is not the first time, nor is the last. And by the way, Ahasuerus, he ends up dying because of an insurrection plan. It was two men. There was uh, the chief of the eunuchs and also one of his uh, chief of his guards. They conspired together and they killed him. And so his life was very much threatened. And I'm not sure what this was about, why they were angry at him, but they were angry at him. And they were talking, not even sure how that... Uh, how that um, um, Mordecai even found out about it. But I will, I do know this. There's something I've prayed for years, and I'm praying now, and I will continue to pray. Lord, let the little bird tell me. And Solomon, Solomon reveals this uh, in his writings in Ecclesiastes about the little bird. He says, don't you talk about the king in your bedchambers, because the little bird will tell. And uh, you need to be very careful about speaking. And just as a rule of thumb, there are some things that shouldn't be talked with everybody. But there's a lot of things that we shouldn't just be talking about at all. That you should just never even say them. And we get real emboldened to speak about things in private because no one hears us. Well, the little bird hears. And I have been, I have myself, God has used that in my favor as a pastor. Uh, not, not to, you know, not to get people, but to help people. Because the little bird has told me things. And he said, Pastor, how did you know about that? And I tell him. The Bible says the little bird will tell. It's incredible how, I, how the Lord has made it such that I knew things I needed to. And I always receive that. As God given me, um, what, do you, what would you call it, uh, uh, marching orders to minister to that person. I don't, it's not a, you know, aha, aha. It's not that. These are marching orders to go and minister to the person. And so, and just as a rule of thumb, be careful. You know, in private, we can be so emboldened. But if you're not willing, as a friend of mine said, don't talk about something or talk about someone in private that you're not willing to say to them openly. And if you do that, then in turn, you're going to live a much more peaceful life because you're not going to have to try to figure out uh, how to make excuse for what you said whenever you found out that you said it. And so these men said whatever they said. Mordecai hears about it. Mordecai then sends a message into Esther. My thought is that Mordecai was concerned for the life of, you know, and, and for Esther herself. Uh, more so than he was for the king. Uh, because Esther, being the queen, that perhaps her life or her stability as a person would be jeopardized if the king would die. Uh, king was assassinated. And so she goes in and she uh, tells the king about this and she makes credit, gives credit to uh, Mordecai. And the result of that is inquisition is made and these two men are hung on a tree. Now one of the ways the Persians would hang people is they would put them up on a tree on a rope and they would take sharp sticks and put them on the ground and they just lower them down on top of sharp sticks and just take them right through the middle of their body and come out their neck. And it was one of the ways they, the Persians, were known to deal with people who were involved in insurrection. You want to make sure they felt the bitterness, uh, their own bitterness they had toward the king, that they felt it themselves. And, uh, and it took their own lives. And so these men die because of that. So <clears throat> that's not exactly what I want to talk about or what I want to finish on today. What I want to finish on is where we've been finished on most, most of the time we finish, is just the idea of God's providence. Providence is pro video. It's the idea that God sees things ahead of time. God already knows about it. And as we've discussed, providence is God's hand in, in the glove of history. God is steering will. He steers it. He doesn't overrule the will of man, but God in turn doesn't allow man to overrule his will and what he wants to accomplish. And so we see in this given instance that we've already seen two instances here in this chapter to where God's providence is actively at work. And in, in this last part here, these men are set to insurrect against the king, but yet it somehow is discovered by Mordecai. And Mordecai then is able to report this and their lives are taken. And so I was, <clears throat> my thought, I've been thinking, last week I had my mind quite a bit on that, that flight 93, United Airlines flight 93, September 11th. Some of you remember that. And... I don't remember all the details, but one detail about it that I thought was unique. These men had prepared, you know, for this attack. 
uh, upon our country for for many 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 months many 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 months and it was there was a lot of resources and training and time and, and so forth in order for them to make this one attack and they they specifically wanted to take out three different three different landmarks one being of course the twin towers and then the capital and then to take out uh, um, the building that's Pentagon. Pentagon. Thank you. The Pentagon. I was going to say the buildings that have shaped the Pentagon shape. Yes. And uh, so, f Flight 93 was delayed, and it set out on the runway for about 40 some minutes. Uh, its flight was delayed. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. And since it was on the runway delayed, then the people that were on the plane they were able to quickly hear the news about you know, these planes that had gone down and attacked the Twin Towers. And so these men in turn were able quickly to understand when they got in the flight and they were hijacked that they in turn, or their, their plane was destined to likewise do the same. And as we know the story that these men, a couple of the men got together and they charged the, you know, charged the, uh, the cockpit and were able to you know, bring the plane to a, you know, to a crash landing before it hit its destination in a field and no one was hurt, or no one outside of the people that were on the plane that were hurt. And so I was thinking about that last week in, in regards to God's providence, how the man makes his plans, and then God directs steps. And that's what Proverbs 16, verse number 9 says, The heart of man deviseth the way, but the Lord directeth the steps. And so this is a great illustration of this in this passage here, that these men were head, headstrong and going in a certain direction, and this is what they're going to do. But our God, in turn, He intervened, because these men are not going to change what God is trying to accomplish. These men are not going to change or alter His will. And so he, in turn, makes sure the little bird tells to the right person who talks to the, to the queen, who gives it to the king, and turn their lives are taken. And, and, and it further continues because at this given point, we know that Mordecai receives nothing. He doesn't get an accolade. He doesn't receive anything for what he's done. But we find out that later in the story of Esther, when, when the Jews in turn are threatened completely and going to be completely annihilated, 15 million Jews that lived in the Persian Empire at that time, that, that the king is awakened one night. And, you know, what better way to put someone to sleep than read the business minutes, amen? And so uh, they got uh, <laughs> the business minutes out, and they're reading the business minutes, the chronicles, and the king comes across this story that we've read here, and the king stops the person who's reading and says, have we given any kind of award to this person? And uh, they said, no, we haven't. And we'll pick that story, that part of the story up later. But it shows, again, the providence of God. Our God, in turn, has wisdom that is, we have no way of even understanding His wisdom. You go ahead and do what you want to do, but God's going to accomplish what He's going to accomplish. And that's what this story helps us to see. And how, how comforting that is, even in the midst of all the turmoil that we've experienced in these last months in our country. And we know that there's been evil at work. But all the evil that is work is not designed... It's not a capable, I'm sorry, of overthrowing what God desires and what God is planning on accomplishing. And so we can rest in that fact that our God, He providentially rules. And we know Psalm 75 is in the Bible, that He is involved even in those people that rise to be queens and those people that, are, that rise to be kings, that He's involved in all of that. Okay, so that's just some uh, fireside chat tonight is what we had. That's what we'll call this, a fireside chat. And so got these thoughts off my mind, and uh, we'll get into next week. I'm looking forward. We'll talk about the Amalekites next week and look forward to that. I found out some really interesting things this last week, doing some studying about them. I find, think you'll find it to be really interesting as well. Okay, with that in mind, let's have prayer and let's uh, go on home. I guess it's going to snow. Is it going to snow? Midnight. Yeah. Midnight, and it's going to ice. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I wanted to say something. I forgot to say my testimony. Yes, ma'am. I want to thank everybody who sent me a card. I got so many cards. Amen. I'm going to keep those and set them around the house so when my house is messy, I can say I didn't stick. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank everybody who did that. People who called to check on. Amen. I 
Thank you all. You're loved, Ms. Wilma. We're glad you're back. Okay. Well, you guys go ahead and stand, and uh, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you for your words, and we pray that you'd help us as we meditate upon what we've seen in Scripture today. Burn in our heart, Lord, a holy desire to want to please you and you only. Please guide us, keep us safe. We do pray, Father, for... As ones who are not with us tonight because of sickness and shut in, we think of Miss Tammy Mills and her continued healing. And we also, Lord, uh, think of Vince and Alice. And they've been away for so long uh, because of their sickness, and especially, Lord, for Miss Alice. Pray for Brother Beckett. And we know, Lord, that Brother Beckett and his wife, they just so much desire to be here, but he just hasn't, uh, hasn't been able to come back. And we pray, Father, for he, that you encourage them and keep them strong. We pray, Father, for... There's so many folks that uh, need help. And we rejoice for what you are doing and pray you'll continue to do a great work in and through our church. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to the back. You're dismissed.